Now, let's go talk about piercing the corporate veil. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, let's move on. Move on to uh, some real positive externalities. Actually, uh, these these are about externalities, um, and and so back to back to teaching mode. So what do we need to cover next? So the next section on piercing the corporate veil has to do with shareholder liability. We spent the majority of the course so far talking about director liability because it related to fiduciary duties. It turns out that shareholders don't have unlimited liability, limited liability in all contexts. There is a limit to limited liability for shareholders. And piercing the corporate veil is the doctrine that sets those limits. So we're going to talk today about piercing the corporate veil in close versus widely held versus public corporations. And that will give us some foundation about why we pierce uh, and highlight some of the main reasons why courts do pierce. Uh, failure to observe corporate formalities is first and foremost uh, among them. Uh, Co-mingling of business and personal assets, effectively treating the corporation like your own personal piggy bank, that's a no-no. Uh, inadequate capitalization, where you've deliberately drained the company of funds so that it cannot pay its debts or, or for its torts and uh, active participation by a shareholder in running the company basically uh, for, their own, for their own purposes, kind of getting us toward what we'll call the alter ego doctrine. And we'll also then cover the reasons for limited liability. Why do we, so maybe the fundamental question is why do we have limited liability in the first place? It turns out that it's a relatively recent innovation, uh, at least in the history of, uh, of business. Um, so I'll provide three suggestions. You're welcome to offer more, but uh, three would include uh, uh, increasing, encouraging investment, uh, uh, allowing for more diversification, right? If you, if you were liable for every investment you made, you may make fewer investments. Remember that chart I showed you at the beginning of the, of the, of the program, right? The more investments you make, the more you diversify away, idiosyncratic risk. That's a good thing. You can diversify your money more than you can diversify your capital. And without limited liability, how would we have public markets? I mean, who would invest in a mutual fund if that exposed you to liability for every company in that fund? You might not even have any awareness of it. So it may be a necessary evil. It may not even be that bad. It may be an unnecessary evil. Uh, now, there are three main cases or types of cases, prototypes, where this comes up. And you should be aware of all three so you can issue spot what you're presented with. And they do have slightly different outcomes, although we apply a same general rule. We're going to talk today about contract cases, piercing and contracts. And uh, uh, usually that has to do with, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I have this out of order. We're not talking about contracts today. You guys got to cut me off. I'm saying nonsense up here. We're talking about torts today. We're talking about torts today. And in tort cases, the concepts are going to be about enterprise liability versus individual liability because the cases here are designed to teach that general principle. So we'll think about what enterprise liability means versus shareholder liability. But you were so excited to pierce the veil. I was so excited to pierce the veil. I got all, my, yeah, got all these different directions. We're piercing this way, we're piercing that way. Usually we're piercing up. You know, that's, that's the shareholder up there. You know, sometimes with the group, pow. All right, so then we're going to talk about piercing in contracts cases. And uh, uh, that has to do with uh, assumption of risk. I mean, if you enter into a contract with a corporation, you should know they're not liable. Per, the shareholder is not liable personally. So you would think, actually, that contracts cases would have less piercing because the person who enters into a contract with a corporation, at least someone who's taken this class, right, knows something about corporate law, realizes that the shareholders won't be liable for that contract. But it turns out, actually, interestingly, empirically, contracts seem more piercing than tort cases do. And then we'll talk about piercing in corporate groups. And we have two examples. One is a conventional example where uh, 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 a person went on a, a rather horrible honeymoon vacation, right? So we have the horrible honeymoon vacation example and a, a lawsuit to, against the, the Weston Hotel Group. Uh, and then we have another one involving uh, the Blimpy Sub Company, which I had just like a distant memory, but when I was recently flying out of Omaha, they had a Blimpy Sub Company, and I, I was thinking of all of you uh, as I was eating at Bean Burrito Taco Bell. And so uh, those separate cases will then show you when you pierce and don't pierce in corporate groups. But in general, piercing doesn't happen all that often, although it tends to be litigated a lot and, for that matter, tested on a lot. So it's good to know. And I think by paring it down to sort of uh, three main categories and two main cases in each, we can really get a pretty good idea of how the doctrine operates. It's not a very complicated doctrine, but it's very complicated to apply because of the fact it's, it doesn't have bright line rules. 
In fact, there is no set rule for when a court may pierce the corporate veil. Instead, it's sort of a general set of factors that are frequently presented, but there's no like restatement of corporations like there is in contracts that tells us generally courts apply these five factors. So I'll present factors to you. What's tricky about the real world is that courts will apply whatever factors they deem important, but thankfully there's enough empirical analysis on this that I can say with confidence the factors you should focus on and what factors are often tested on. All right, so what, is the, uh, what does piercing mean? When I say piercing the corporate veil, what do I mean? What is this veil that we're going through? Simple definition for it. Ian, yeah. It's like the liability that usually protects shareholders. Yeah, that li so the veil is this concept of liability, and shareholders are on this other side of the curtain. It's like the Wizard of Oz back there, right? And so the dog roams up and pulls down the curtain, and suddenly you see the man behind the curtain. And, and so the veil represents the limited liability, and, and piercing that is effectively disregarding that limited liability. And uh, it's often described as a dis disregarding the entity itself, effectively saying that the corporation, uh, the whole nature of corporations is limited liability. So by removing limited liability and going right to the shareholder, you're effectively saying the entity was never real. I mean, the Wizard of Oz metaphor holds up better than you might think because when you pierce the veil, when you pull back the curtain and you expose the Wizard of Oz, you actually learn that a lot of what seemed like divine intervention wasn't actually real, right? It was a lot of trickery, if you will, you know? And a person abusing an entity for his own or her own purposes. And so piercing is this equitable doctrine and it, it's used to prevent fraud and achieve justice. I'm always a little skeptical about broad ideas like achieving justice, uh, preventing fraud is a little narrower. Uh, the, so the problem with a doctrine that's as broad as saying we're going to disregard an entity when necessary for the interest of justice, we don't get a lot of very clear standards out of something like that. It gives courts a lot of flexibility and, and that's what you often find in equitable doctrine. So this is, as I, as I mentioned, I think in an equitable doctrine and a court will decide to pierce the corporate veil uh, when justice requires. Now, fortunately, I'll present to you uh, several factors now which come up uh, in most of these piercing cases. And so those factors are uh, that lead to uh, piercing, whether or not the corporation is closely held, owned by a few people or one person, versus widely held, owned by many people but not publicly traded, or public, owned by millions of people. It turns out that public corporations are basically never pierced, and that, that will make more sense as we go through the reasons. But when the shareholder is also, we, when you have a sole shareholder who's also the CEO, the president, the secretary, right, and he's running the corporation for his own benefit when there are other mitigating, aggravating factors, we do see piercing. And so these are generally very small corporations that get pierced. Very small corporations that get pierced. The other reason that it's small corporations that get pierced is the reason that we're piercing is because some creditor, a torque creditor or a, uh, or a contract creditor is saying, I'm not getting paid, right? There's some kind of undercapitalization. So that's the other factor that, that's a big factor is undercapitalization. The company cannot pay what it owes. So what is motivating the piercing also is a factor for it. If the company can pay its debts, no one's gonna be looking for the shareholders to be on the hook. This only comes up when People don't get paid. Um, other factors courts will look at make sense in an equitable realm. We think about fairness. We think about good faith and fair dealing in an equitable realm. And so deceiving creditors. Deceiving creditors uh, is another factor. If there's deceit or fraud on the part of the shareholder, that's going to elevate the chance of finding piercing. And that's to protect third parties who would not be able to know. You don't know if you're being deceived. If you've been tricked or duped or fooled, it's equitable for the law to step in and help you. <clears throat> um, all right, observing corporate formalities. That's our next factor, meaning all that stuff we talked about last semester, all that authorization stuff, all the board minutes, right? That's all coming back now. I hope you remember it. <laughs> We're not being tested on it again. At least I don't think so. But hopefully you remember how all that authorization worked because if that's not done properly, if the corporation has been acting without authorization, that shows that the shareholders are running the corporation for their own benefit. It shows that they're indifferent to obligations to third parties. Those formalities are meant to protect third parties vis-a-vis -vis the corporation by requiring the corporation to act in a certain manner. 
Respect the form or lose the benefits is the message to shareholders. Um, commingling assets. Right? In addition to undercapitalizing, you might have a shareholder which treats the company as their own piggy bank. We saw this in Francis v. Pritchard, right? That was a great case for piercing there, in addition to director liability, because they were actually treating the company like their own personal bank account. And so, again, what's the risk here? The risk is that creditors are confused. They think that their money is going to be available. Uh, it's also a bit of deception. It also is not a respect for the corporate form. I mean, if you're going to take a loan from the company, you need to paper that. A lot of times when folks are running a corporation, uh, a closely held corporation, they're taking that money out of the account. They're not having board meetings about it. And so corporate form comes back in here. And um, the courts will also look at defendants actively participating in the business. So if the shareholders are passive, right? does anyone here own a share of Microsoft? Maybe through mutual funds? OK, I, I probably got a quarter of a share somewhere. I can't tell you the last time they asked for my opinion on whether or not Windows 10 is any good. Right, so I don't actually participate in Windows management at all. In fact, I can't remember the last time I was even notified that they had a board meeting. I probably don't even meet some minimum threshold. On the other hand, I'm the president of a small company called BizLaw, and I just use that company to buy a car, right? I mean, that's heavily involved. I actually drive that car, right? So. That's a really different story than my relationship to Microsoft. That's a company that I'm running. I have a consulting operation that I do out of it. It's, it's, it is not that different from me personally. And so with that company, I'm very careful to have a separate business banking account, a separate credit card. I mean, I was going up to my account the other day. I took a business trip, and I stayed at a Starwoods hotel. I love Starwoods Hotel, by the way. Don't get me started on Starwoods Hotels. I'm just so worried I'm going to lose my status this year. I'm just Anyway, so I, I stay at a hotel, and I use my Amex, my Starwoods Amex card as my personal Amex card. But it's a business expense, so then I have to go back and audit and find out, okay, I spent $732 in New York, or whatever it was. I got stuck there, if you remember. Uh, oh, did I didn't tell you guys? I got stuck there on the snowstorm. So I flew to New York on Tuesday to give a talk on Wednesday. Not only did I get stuck there that night, but they canceled the talk. <laughs> they, closed, they, they, closed Cardozo, they closed Cardozo Law School, where I was supposed to give a talk. So I get to New York, and I literally am like watching it. I didn't even bring, actually, oh, I bought these shoes because I didn't have, I didn't have waterproof shoes. <laughs> right? I was like walking around sneakers in New York, being like, what am I going to do? Anyway, it was expensive, uh, and it was a bit, but it was a business expense. It was a business expense. I was there for business purposes. And so even though I use my personal credit card to avoid any commingling of assets, I'm going to pay that portion of my credit card bill out of my personal bank account. And that's the level of scrutiny you really need to apply to make sure that you're not violating some of these uh, veil piercing rules. All right? Very different than my relationship with Microsoft. All right, so let me go back over those factors just so you have them in your minds as we're beginning. The factors are whether the corporation is closely held, widely held, or public. Closely held being the factor that preferences piercing. Whether the insiders deceived creditors or otherwise committed fraud or wrong, as you can imagine, committing the fraud or wrong, that's the factor that increases likelihood of piercing. If the insiders failed to uh, observe formalities, they didn't have board actions, if the company was, if the, if the CEO was acting frequently without authorization and is also the shareholder, which relates to whether the defendants actively participated in the business, right? When you have a shareholder who's also the CEO, that's a much closer issue. It gives them the ability to run the company without process. Commingling business and personal assets, right? So again, being, being very careful to keep that separate bank account, issue those separate payments. Although, it turns out I get to keep the points, which is cool. Um, I did check with my accountant about that. Uh, so commingling assets is an issue, and obviously it's the commingling, it's the mixing of business and personal that says the company is not real. It's not functioning at its purpose. It's not acting like a corporation should. Um, whether the investors did not adequately capitalize the business, if they're basically externalizing the risks of running the business. Now, this is not so much an issue with something like consulting services, but it's a much bigger issue, as we'll see if you're driving cabs around New York and running into people. You know? Or to give you a more uh, poignant more recent example, what if Uber created a subsidiary for its self-driving cars, as, Apple, as, uh, as Google did? Waymo is a subsidiary for Google, right, for the self-driving cars. And what if the subsidiary of Uber, 
right? We'll call them Boober, because they made a big boo-boo, right? So they're driving around these cars and they're extracting all the money from the company and giving it back to, to, to the parent. Now that would make sense if you're worried about whacking people with, uh, with your vehicles and not paying the bill, but that's exactly the kind of action that gets corporations into trouble. And so I would imagine that Waymo has a lot of, at least insurance, if not capitalization. And we'll see a case to it that, that evaluates whether capitalization by insurance is enough or you actually have to have money in the bank. All right, so those are our factors, and let's take a look at how they come into play. Audio oh, mute. Okay. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, uh, just in, in the throat clearing preliminaries again, that, um, that th this, by the way, is all developed by scholars who have analyzed all these cases. This is not set in stone anywhere, but as you'll see, it, it, it does seem to make sense. What are the factors that are going to result in piercing the most? Professor Thompson wrote an empirical study in 1991, a little dated, but things haven't changed that much in the corporate world, and found that piercing was never employed in public corporations and was most often applied in order of these factors, one, where there was a misrepresentation or fraud, right? so wrongdoing by the shareholders using the company to commit a fraud, that was the number one reason. Number two, commingling of assets. Think of Francie, Francis V. Pritchard dipping into the till, and as a result, those uh, reinsurance brokers don't have access to the money they're supposed to. Inadequate capitalization was number three, which is similar. It means you're not mixing your business and personal funds, but you're constantly draining the business of any funds, so it doesn't have any ability to pay its debts, and you're effectively being enriched because you've drained the company. This is not just a company doing badly, but actually taking the money out of it when it's doing well, so it has nothing. And usually there's an element of fraud there too. And failure to observe corporate formalities was four. Right? And again, that only happened in, in private corporations and generally closely held ones. So this comes back to the question of why do we have this policy? Why do we have limited liability at all? It's really the fundamental question. Um, limited liability, first off, is not a mandatory rule. You can contract around limited liability, and you may have to. So, as I mentioned, I have a company, BizLaw, and this company bought a car. But this is a very young company. i got to admit, I don't actually make that much money with it. Hopefully be net positive this year. We'll see. If I keep going to, going to conferences where they're shutting down for the, for the storm, it's not going to happen so fast. But, uh, or, you know, if I never get this book written this summer. But in any event, um, when I went to buy the car, I wanted to put it in the business name because I use it for getting to, to business activities and whatever. And so uh, uh, I asked, uh, you know, for a loan. I don't have the money for it. Well, the business doesn't have any credit. And you're not going to loan to the business because, as I mentioned, there are no assets that it has to take and can be dissolved. And so I gave a personal guarantee. Right? I co-own the car. This is actually a good thing <coughs> from an accounting perspective because I don't book all of the use of the car to the business and so there's some allocation and right, work with the accountant to figure out how much of this, how much of that. But in this example you can see that I don't have unlimited, I don't have limited liability as to the car payments. Right? Which is why Bank of America gave me a call. They say, you're seven days late. Did you make your payments? I said, oh, I didn't actually set that up. Sorry. Um, so the point, the point of, that, of that brief story is that you can contract around limited liability, and often you have to, because limited liability is not so good for, for creditors. Now, piercing is not contracting around, but it is a doctrine that makes sense given the history of limited liability. In the mid-19th century, the first limited liability companies, limited liability uh, corporations began to arise, and they didn't really catch on until the 20th century. Um, and courts still think of limited liability as a gift that can be taken away. Uh, uh, not, not an inalienable right in any case. So why would we allow this gift, which effectively advantages shareholders over creditors? Why? Well, it encourages investment. You're not going to make an investment in a company, well, you might in some, but you'd be more hesitant to invest in a company if that investment results in you being personally liable for its debts. And so limited liability means the shareholders are more able to invest their money, which also increases diversification because as I mentioned, 
if you do have to monitor a company that you invest in, you're going to invest in fewer of them because you have to make sure they're not doing things that will get you in trouble. So now we can diversify our capital better. It encourages management to take risks. Right? What are we going to, if, again, we're, we're not diversified, we've got all our money in this company, we're liable for it, we're watching the managers like a hawk, and we're telling them, be really careful here, because I can't afford a loss. On the other hand, we've talked about it, the purpose of corporations is to create risk, is to take risk, is to bring on that risk, and be risk-seeking. And so, uh, without, uh, without this, you would not have management taking that risk, or at least you'd have shareholders who are not pushing for risk-taking activities and you know, risk reward, et cetera. It wouldn't be possible to have stock markets. Well, how would that even work if every shareholder in Microsoft, like me, who never even got, gets a proxy statement because I own like 12 cents worth, is liable for their entire amount? And who are you going to go after? That also means that the wealthiest people in the world would not, right? If everyone, in a, if everyone who invests in a corporation is joint and severally liable, they're not going to go after me. Right? I'm having trouble making car payments, right? They're going to go after uh, uh, um, Buffett. Right? They're going to go after the deep pockets. And so if there was unlimited liability and it was joint in sh several, which I imagine how it would come about, uh, the Warren Buffets of the world would exit the market. And we can get into, you can kind of imagine the problems there. So we need it for corporations, essentially. At least that's my position. But there are arguments against it, right? And it discourages lending, although I think that can be solved pretty easily. As in the example I gave, they said, we can't give you a loan to BizLaw. But we'll give a loan if you guarantee it. OK, fine. Fine. They contracted around the issue. So I don't agree with that particular criticism. It enables insider opportunism. Well, that's true. That's true. right? You do have more opportunism because with limited liability, if there isn't a way to pierce, a person can steal from the company and effectively steal from the creditors and enrich themselves inappropriately, which is an externalization of a certain type of risk, this type of agency risk. The shareholders become agents for the creditors, and they take advantage. And it would increase, increase shareholder irresponsibility. So the doctrine of veil piercing is meant to balance that sense of irresponsibility that would otherwise result. Um, it also highlights the notion that shareholders and creditors of a company really have very different interests. And we get into this more in venture capital law, where we talk about why a company would get an equity investment, not a debt investment. It's very different to be involved in a company on a debt basis than on an equity basis. Uh, an equity investment is going to be really in it for the long haul. A debt investor just wants their money back with interest. And so the amount of risk a debt holder wants you to take is low. Right? I mean, again, the bank who lent me the car, they care that the collateral is not impaired. If I don't pay, they're going to take the collateral. So they care that I don't take risks. On the other hand, maybe I should be driving frequently to make more money for the business. To, you know, maybe it's better if I drive 90 miles an hour to get somewhere to, to meet a client, right? And take an opportunity to win, to win a, an opportunity to take a case. And if I do that enough, sure, I'll get some speeding tickets or crash the car, but maybe I'll get that big case that lands me a million bucks and have that huge upside. Unlikely in my line of work, but nice to think about. And so there is this conflict between debt and equity holders, and this really highlights it. Um, and some argue whether or not corporations should be used as a way to externalize risk at all. I mean, we see this in Dodd-Frank. What happened with Dodd-Frank? Do you guys remember this one? The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act of 2010. So you may or may not remember that in 2007, 8, banks had a lot of these CDO squares and other toxic investments. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. oh you're going to. Yeah, that, was, that was long before we were saying about it. Was long too, but there's a lot of bad, a lot of bad investing. It's a lot of it was. Uh, Falling further around the market, the I'm sorry, housing market as well. And when there was a crash in several markets at once, a lot of the banks that were deemed this is where the phrase like too big to fail first came out. Right. It was a combination of both the banking and the automotive industry. And uh, because of all of the, these these large banks, which means that if they did fail, it would ruin uh, the, the, the economy in several sectors. Uh, the government stepped in when it did step in to help the bailout of both banks and the automotive industry. They went about saying, okay, we can't ever have this again. <coughs> And put in a whole slew of, uh, of rules and regulations that came in and regulated how they can lend, man, how, how banks can actually lend and make money, which simultaneously the arguments have been uh, greatly protecting the consumers while heavily restricting the banks' ability to actually make money off of what they do. And it also led to the uh, employment of 
a lot more with attorneys by large <laughs> yeah. banks. Attorneys did well under Dodd Frank. Yes. For sure. Right. We had to do all kinds of compliance tasks and create dashboards and all this risk management. And, and, and exactly right, as Joe pointed out, what was the effect, of, what was the reason for Dodd-Frank? That companies were so big that if they failed, it wasn't just the shareholders that went down, they'd take entire sectors of the economy. And the government said that we can't let that be, so we're going to prevent companies from getting that big. Well, that may or may not be efficient, and it certainly has a lot of compliance costs to it. But that's what I mean by externalizing risk. Think about the financial crisis. And corporations in general externalize their risks because of limited liability. The people that benefit, who have the upside, have a limited downside. And so if the money in the corporation is going to go below zero, the shareholders don't pay for it. Someone else is left holding the bag. Someone else is not compensated. And so some people think that's unfair. So uh, piercing, then, is really a, a way to protect creditors. And so if you want to think about piercing law, the origins, at least, are protecting creditors. And you might think of maybe this is why they pierce more often in contracts cases than in torts cases, because we really were thinking about that sort of creditor. But when I think about torts, actually, I think you can think about contract creditors as voluntary creditors. And you would think about tort creditors as involuntary creditors. I mean, no one, well, I don't know about no one, people generally don't want to get hit by a bus. If you get hit by a bus, however, you can sue and potentially get damages, hopefully to make you whole, right? But people generally do not step in front of buses because they voluntarily want to be in a tort relationship. Although, on the other hand, you might make a loan on a bus, right? You might want to be in a contract relationship for that bus. And so it's important to think about the voluntary and involuntary creditor, but they are both creditors. There are some alternatives, however, for creditors. Um, there are two that you should just be generally aware of. One is fraudulent conveyance and one is equitable subordination. Has anyone here taken bankruptcy? Anyone here going to take bankruptcy? Do we even offer bankruptcy? We do offer bankruptcy, right? I never took bankruptcy. It's one of those classes that if you don't take it, it's extremely hard to like go out and learn on your own. And it's a good, it's a good subject, uh, at least I'm told. Uh, but we have some additional protections then for creditors in bankruptcy. So a fraudulent conveyance comes from the bankruptcy concept and it allows the court to set aside a transfer by an insolvent or nearly insolvent corporation to its creditors. So a corporation might be going under, might be having a lot of financial distress, and before it makes its last few payments to its creditors who are coming after for the unpaid loan, right? the, the company then dividends all of its money out to its shareholders. And effectively, a court can reverse that transaction, can void it, make it as if it never happened under the doctrine of fraudulent conveyance. And equitable subordination happens when a company is in bankruptcy. You may be familiar with the concept of priority, even if you haven't taken bankruptcy. You have senior lenders, junior lenders, preferred stockholders, common stockholders. They all have claims on the residual assets in bankruptcy, but some people get to be paid first, right? First priority. And so equitable subordination moves someone from a higher priority to a lower priority. So, for example, you run a company. You give yourself a loan. You are now a creditor. You're, you, lo you lend money to the company, and you say that I'm the senior creditor. Well, the court can potentially push you back down the pecking order if you did that wrongfully. But as you can see, these are pretty limited. So let me give you a quick hypothetical here. Uh, so our friend Wanda here uh, goes to medical school. And so she graduates medical school, and unlike lawyers, she makes a lot of money afterwards. No, I'm kidding. I hope you all have the same problem here. <laughs> Wanda is then oppressed by her heavy student loans. I mean, none of you, I'm sure, can imagine such a situation where you're out there and you're making lots of money, but you feel poor because you have all these loans. I'm sure that's foreign, a foreign concept. So you come up with a scheme. You come up with a scheme because you have $400,000 of medical loans and making $200,000 a year as a doctor Still, you feel poor, so you're paying back all these loans. And what you do is you assign, you don't get married, you're in, a, you're in a partnership, and you assign all of your income to your partner. Assign all of your, you know, call, a, call them Howard, let's say. So Wanda and Howard over here. So Wanda has assigned all of her income to Howard. He puts it in his bank account, and he's a dutiful husband. He's going to take care of everything around the house. He's going to do the housework. He's going to be a perfect doctor, spouse. And that's the consideration, right? Perfect partner, right? So the, the consideration is I will give you all of my income and you will cook and clean and take care of the house, Howard. And Howard signs on for this. And then Wanda has no money. She's working, but she has no money. And so her creditors sue her 
right? The house that she lives in, they sue her for that. The, the, the car that she drives, and more importantly, what she can't give the collateral back, her student loans. She owes us money in student loans, and she did this to avoid it. And she says, I'm sorry, I can't pay back those student loans. I don't have any money. Howard has all the money, but we're not even married. I conveyed all my money to Howard. The lenders are upset, but they don't have any contractual provision. There's, when you take your student loans, nothing says you can't assign your income. No one says you can't donate 90% of your income to UNICEF or give it to grandma, right? There's no con you didn't sign that contract. So can Wanda do this? Seems like a great scheme. Not such a great scheme. Why not? Because the creditors will argue the assignment of income was done with the intention of avoiding paying the bank. And it was fraudulent because it was done without due consideration. Right? We need to have a doctrine to protect against this. And in fact, we have a statute. It's the Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act, the UFTA of 1984. And it protects creditors from two types of transfers. One were the, uh, the, the um, not the creditor, the creditee, the one where someone transfers with the intent to defraud creditors. So actual scienter, and that actually has to be pled with a showing of intention to defraud. So you need some kind of document from Wanda saying, check this out, Howard, I've got the best scheme ever. I'm never gonna pay my creditors back a red cent. I'm gonna take them for a ride by signing all my money to you. And they somehow find that before even pleading. Very high standard. Right, pleading fraud is very difficult, but you have to prove intentional fraud at a pleading stage. You can imagine how often that happens. Or a transfer that constructively defrauds creditors. That might be easier to prove, constructive defrauding. And that can be shown if the debtor makes a transfer while near, near insolvent, but it requires a specific finding of a fraudulent transaction. And so these are difficult to prove. Take a look at the Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act to understand that a little more. Uh, but that's one alternative to veil piercing, is we could set aside what Wanda did because uh, or a corporation named Wanda did. Um, how about equitable subordination? Well, that simply occurs in bankruptcy. So there has to be a federal bankruptcy proceeding, and some creditors can get pushed back to the back of the line, and to invoke that there again has to be showing a fraudulent concept, mismanagement, or equitable subordination. And it's very limited because this is only applicable to companies in bankruptcy. So these are not great alternatives. And so we need another alternative to protect creditors who are at an imbalance. Some will say that we need it to protect creditors so that they will invest in companies. I don't agree with those people. I think those creditors can contract around it themselves. Generally, creditors are sophisticated. But for the other reasons about trying to avoid uh, impropriety, I think it is important. So let's talk about our first case, which is Walkowski versus Carlton. So anyone want to help me through that one? Facts of Walkowski. Which case was this, right? We have, we have two big accident cases here. Ashley. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the plaintiff, Walkowski, was run over by a taxi cab that was owned by defendant Beyond Cab Corporation. Mm -hmm. um, defendant Marquez owned several cab companies that were operated independently of another. Great. You get hit by a cab and you think, all right, that sucked, but at least I can sue him. But how much money did this cab company actually have? The company itself or the insurance? Yeah, the, the cab, he was hit by a cab company, right? right. And well, it doesn't, in this case, it doesn't actually really matter much, but um, he was hit by a cab from Sion Co. and they had $10,000 of insurance. It doesn't, in, in fact, we'll see in the next case, at least according to the majority, whether it's cash or insurance, self insurance or actual insurance, doesn't matter. Why did they have $10,000 of insurance? It was the minimum that was required. That was the minimum required by law. I want to come back to that concept because there are some arguments about policy that I think are worth mentioning here. And so, um, who did you say owns Sion? Marquez. All right. I'll, I'm not actually calling up for this one. Seemed like a good idea at the time. All right. So, um, right, the cab company is going to be, uh, oh, the driver is Marquis, right? So we're going to put him, whatever. It doesn't matter. He's got no money either. All right? No, it was, uh, 
It was owned by Carlton. Now, what else did Carlton own? Many other cat companies. Nine other cat companies. Yeah, many other cat companies. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Guys got ten cat companies. And guess what? They've all got ten thousand dollars of insurance. Big surprise there. He has the minimum. Okay, so what's the lawsuit going to allege? What's the claim? That it was an intent to defraud a potential or victim. Yeah, so uh, well, what is, well, well, maybe I'll put it different. What does W. Walkowski uh, uh, want? He wants money, right? And 10,000 is not enough. He gets his 10,000. He wants more money. Who has more money? All the entities. This one, this one, this one, this one, right? There's more money here. There's at least 10,000 aggregate in each of these. And we're going to assume Carlton is a wealthy dude. He's got a couple cabs. He's got money. He's been pulling money out of this enterprise. All right, so. This is veil piercing, right? Because what is this? This is the shareholder limited liability veil right there. Does Wolkowski pierce Sion Cab's limited liability veil and get to Carlton's bank account? No, we don't have piercing here. Why does the court find that we don't have piercing? What does Judge Fold have to say? What is the purpose, Judge Fold says, is for veil piercing? He says the law permits incorporation of a business the very purpose of establishing enabling its proprietors to escape limited liability, but the privilege is not without limits. Have we reached the limits here? No, we haven't reached the limits here. So let's look at why. Well, first off, I should point out that there actually are two different claims. All right, I'm gonna do my piercing up and piercing out. Carlton is up. Carlton is the shareholder. We always draw the shareholder, the owner, above the company. And so we have a type of piercing here that would go to the individual shareholder but they also want to pierce out. And we're going to talk about piercing in corporate groups, but effectively, that's a different theory. So what is the name of the piercing out theory to the other cab companies? Enterprise liability, right? So we have two different theories at work, enterprise liability and individual liability, piercing up. So did the court find that Carlton was, for example, stealing from the company? No, he wasn't stealing from the company. Did the company find that Carlton was not observing corporate formalities? No, no allegations of corporate formalities. Did it find that Carlton was really not running a cab company but driving this cab for his own personal transit? No, this is a guy who's really running a cab company. What was the only claim, the only factor that Walkowski could maybe hang his hat on here. What was the only thing in our factors list that really uh, jumps out? That he was purposefully undercapitalizing the company. Yeah, 10,000's not enough, guy. You can whack somebody, and it's going to cost more than that for even a broken leg. You know, cabs getting it. They, they whack things. They drive around New York. I mean, forget about it. It's not enough money to be fully capitalized. But he was meeting his legal requirements. So let's turn to the dissent for a second. The court's opinion, by the way, Ken said that, that this was not undercapitalization. This was not, this was minimal capitalization, right? In fact, if he, there's a statute out there. If he had 9,000, I think that, you know, that probably would have been under, right? Not meeting a statutory minimum, but the court said he met his statutory amount. Judge Keating disagreed. What does the dissent have to say about this? The dissent was looking at um, the intent of the legislator, and mm -hmm. the case was that they were not intending to allow the defendants to organize this business in a way of legal liability. So this is interesting. I want to focus on this argument because I think it's dead wrong. Why do you think I think this is a bad argument? The argument, again, is that the legislative policy is that cabs should not be able to hurt people with impunity. Well, then why did they make the limit 10,000? 
I mean, if the legislative intention was that cabs have enough money to, to make sure that they take care of their damages, let's put another zero on that. You carry 100,000. Why do you carry, why carry a million? Or for that matter, that medallion you've got up there, why are you protecting that from being, from lawsuits? I actually have a story for you about why they're protecting that from lawsuits. I have a video on that too. Let me see if I can actually get that up because I think this is a, a, a theory worth hearing. And while that boots up, I'll kind of talk about it. So I don't agree with the argument that there was undercapital. I agree this is minimally capitalized, but if the legislature wants cab companies to have more insurance, why not have the law require more insurance? I think that's why the majority was the better answer here. Now, of course, we feel bad for people, but this is a, we need a legislative solution. We don't need a judicial activist solution, right? We need a legislative solution. So what did Wolkowski want? Let's think about that. He wanted two things. He wanted the court to combine the assets of the cab companies. That's called enterprise liability. And he wanted to pierce the corporate veil to go after the individual shareholder because this is important. The structure was an unlawful attempt to defraud members of the general public. Yeah. Now, what was the, what was the result here? Well, the result was, as you might expect, that it wasn't found because we didn't have those plus factors. We did have the issue that this is a, uh, uh, a closely held company, which is, I don't know if I'd call it a factor. That's more of an enabling condition. Without it being closely held, we don't have them. But I want to talk briefly about tax medallions. I want to share with you an economic theory. And I hope you can see the video, but it's mostly about hearing this guy. I just thought this is, this guy, I love his, I love his approach. So, my question for you then, why are taxi medallions judgment proof? Why are taxi medallions judgment proof? Who would want that? Well, clearly we know who the Baptist is, the public figure. The taxi drivers, you own a medallion, you don't want to lose it. They're expensive. Who else cares that medallions are judgment proof? A medallion costs upward of a million dollars. Yeah. How do you get, how do you think, how do you think our buddy Carlton got his 10 medallions? Think he had $10 million before he started a company? How do you get a taxi medallion? How do you get a million dollars? Take out a loan. It turns out there's an entire industry dedicated to taxi loans. And so one of the biggest advocates for protecting taxi medallions are not the taxi drivers, but the banks. The banks are the bootlegger in this story. The banks are the ones behind the scenes. They want to protect their collateral. They don't care if people who get run over get hurt. Not in, not in that sense. They're a corporation. They have their narrow-minded interest of focusing on their profits. And those profits come from protecting that collateral. And we see the story of the bootlegger Baptist in the fight in New York against Uber. And we saw the story again, the same story as the medallions. What happened in the fight against Uber? Well, sure, taxi companies, in fact, it wasn't even really taxi drivers that fought hard against Uber. It was really taxi unions. And that makes sense to me, at least, because the truth is, if you're a taxi driver, if you like driving a car, you may not care whether you drive for Uber or if you drive for Yellow Cab. As long as you get paid more, and if the labor market is competitive, having a new entrant might actually be better for you as a driver, maybe. But who opposed Uber behind the scenes? Who was the bootlegger in that story? Again, it was those banks who were worried that, in fact, after Uber went in, the value of a taxi medallion in New York fell from a million to $500,000. If you were a bank, and you're worried about your collateral, this is a major threat to your business model. And so when you see something that doesn't make sense, when you see a regulation that just doesn't make sense, really $10,000 liability and, uh, and, and, a, and a, a presumption that medallions are judgment proof, why would this regulation last for so long? I think the, the story of the bootlegger Baptist is a good thing to think about when you see a durable regulation. You have to ask, who's on the other side? I mean, I love the example they give about how environmentalists have actually made the environment worse by requiring clean standards. How does this happen? How can an environmentalist end up creating more pollution? Well, by requiring new standards, the question is on whom? Who will have to meet those new standards? The answer is new businesses. In general, the old 
production is exempt, right? That's what they lobby for behind the scenes. And they go and they support the idea that in the future, new businesses that have power plants have to have these high-tech scrubbers and have to have low carbon emissions, which is very expensive. And so what does this mean for the, cur the current competitors? It means that no one can compete with them. It means that if you've got a coal factory from 1945, not only do you not have to put a scrubber on it, but someone can't build one up the road that's more efficient. And old coal factories, it turns out, are less efficient. They produce more emissions. And so one of the unintended consequences of some of these regulations, when misapplied, is that it can actually have the counterintuitive effect that by increasing the regulation on coal, you actually can increase pollution. And so it's an important story to think about, and I thought this case was a chance to bring that economic concept up. All right, we have a, just a few more minutes. We have one more case to talk about. And so this was Radiswicki versus Telecom Corp. And it's another accident case. So what happened here? All right, so our friend, our, uh, our friend Radiswicki was riding his motorcycle. My dad calls them donor bikes, right? So I don't know if any of you drive one. Drive carefully, especially in the rain out here. And he was seriously injured by a truck driven by an employee of Constructs, right? I mean, driving a motorcycle is an assumption of risk, but he didn't assume this risk. What happened to him was that he sued Constructs, and he is an involuntary creditor. Now, the jury decided he was entitled to damages. He was not at fault. I mean, you take some assumption of risk by riding a motorcycle, but not the risk of getting hit by a truck and not paid for it. So the jury finds that Conrad Rudiswicki is deserving of money. So what happens to the money? Well, Constructs doesn't have much money. It's not heavily capitalized. It's minimally capitalized, like most businesses are. It's actually a subsidiary, but it has insurance. They had the mandatory statutory insurance. However, their insurance company went bust. And what happens to our friend Radiswicki? Well, he's left holding the bag, right? He's injured, and he's deserving of compensation, and the system is not giving it to him. So he sues. And he sues on the theory that he should be able to pierce the corporate veil in the upward direction and go after the parent company, Telecom. Telecom owns the insurance company as well, by the way, although that doesn't seem to make a huge difference here. So the question is whether, under Missouri law, Radiswicki could pierce the corporate veil and hold Telecom liable for the conduct of its subsidiary. And it turns out that the rules for a corporate parent versus a, a, an individual shareholder really aren't different. Right? This is a little different in that at the top of that is not an individual but another company. But the court doesn't seem to care and finds that no, we're not going to allow piercing in this context. Why? Because it wasn't being treated as an alter ego. It wasn't undercapitalized. It was minimally capitalized. It wasn't having any wrongdoing. It was operating properly. It had no reason to know. I mean, why would anyone buy insurance deliberately from a company that's going insolvent? That, that didn't make sense. There didn't seem to be any, any wrongdoing there. And the court cites a case that you should know of, Collett. Collett versus American National Stores. You don't have to cite to Collett. You can cite directly to Radiswicki, but it sets out three things a plaintiff has to show in order to pierce. So what is our three-part test? First prong of the three-part test is control. And not just any control, but here they mean complete domination. Complete domination not only of finances, but of policy, business practice, in respect to the transaction. So much control, in fact, that the burden is on the plaintiff to show that the corporate entity at the time and as to this transaction had no separate mind, was completely dominated by the parent or the shareholder. And two, that control was used by the defendant, by the shareholder, by the parent to commit fraud or wrong, to perpetuate the violation of a duty or other positive legal duty. Okay, high burden, right? To actually show that that control was used to create wrongdoing. And three, that that control and breach of duty proximately caused the harm. So that's the three-part test set out in Radiswicki, which is known as the alter ego doctrine. It is not the only way under which you can pierce. As I mentioned, there is no one standard for piercing, but this was a particular kind of liability called the alter ego doctrine, essentially saying that the subsidiary 
was not different from the parent at all, was completely dominated from it, had no separate mind or existence of its own, and that control was used to perpetuate, commit a fraud or wrong, and that fraud or wrong approximately caused the injury. That is the alter ego doctrine. So, Radiswicki argues that constructs was undercapitalized, and that goes to the second prong. How is undercapitalization something that the defendant uses to commit fraud or wrong? Well, the district court agreed with the argument, so we can look to that for that and say the district court found that constructs was undercapitalized in an accounting sense. And although it had some amount of money, it did not have enough to satisfy uh, uh, its, uh, uh, its debt in this case. So the district court took a very narrow view, and by the way, spoiler alert, it was overturned, took a narrow view and said, because you couldn't pay your debts in this instance, they had $10 million in coverage and a million in basic liability, and that wasn't enough for reasons that turned out later in hindsight. The district court held that the federal regulation did not say what was enough, but in this case, it was proven not to be enough with the benefit of hindsight. Well, the Eighth Circuit reversed and restored us to a state of the world that looks a lot like Walkowski. The Eighth Circuit disagreed and said the whole purpose of asking whether a, a subsidiary was properly capitalized was to determine its financial responsibility. If the subsidiary was financially responsible, the part of the test, the second part was met. If you're being financially responsible, you are not committing fraud or wrongdoing with your financing. And so insurance should be enough. In fact, insurance in some ways is better because it covers, it could potentially cover much more. I mean, you, if you have $100,000 in the bank, you can get a lot of insurance for that, depending on what you're doing. You might get $10 million in insurance versus $100,000 in the bank. That could really help uh, our, our, our motorcyclist in getting made whole. And so they don't distinguish between insurance and cash in the bank so long as they're meeting their requirements. And it was beyond dispute that contracts had insurance and therefore it was considered financially reasonable under applicable federal regulation. The court found the doctrine of limited liability was developed precisely for this situation, to protect a parent from a subsidiary who goes broke. To protect a parent whose subsidiary goes broke, that's the point of the doctrine. It would be destroyed if every parent corporation would be liable every time a subsidiary did not have sufficient funds. All that, was, all that uh, Radis Wiki showed in this case was at the end of the day, they didn't have enough money to pay him. Well, that happens. We can have a different conversation, going back to corporate social responsibility, purpose of corporations, whether that's fair that we allow corporations to externalize risk, but they do, within bounds. We have not exceeded the bounds yet. We still have not seen a case. Now, the senior circuit judge, Heaney, disagreed. Heaney argued that Contrux was just a shell corporation, and it was established by telecom only to allow telecom to operate as a non-union carrier. Contracts is driving around. They don't want to employ union people. Telecom, I guess, had union contracts. or was susceptible to unions. And Judge Heaney actually argued that they were avoiding union laws. Now, I think that one reason that argument doesn't hold water is because it doesn't meet the third prong. What's the third prong? The third prong is that the, the control and breach of duty must proximately cause the injury. If telecom set up constructs to avoid paying union dues, did the failure to have union members cause the harm? That's much more attenuated. Now, it's possible you might find some argument that union drivers are safer. Maybe union truck drivers are safer because they get more breaks and are paid more or what have you, or it's harder to be selected for, and so that would reduce the risk of harm. That argument was not successful. That's way too attenuated. And so, I would disagree with Heaney in that he did not address the third prong of that argument. But you know, you get these kind of cases where you feel bad. Someone gets terribly injured in a motorcycle accident. You'd like to see them made whole. But the, I think the court rightly held, the Eighth Circuit rightly held, that uh, that was not the correct result in this case. Undercapitalization is not inherently even unlawful. It depends on the reason for doing it, right? Going back to that alter ego test, the second prong is used to commit fraud or wrongdoing. Courts, some courts have inserted a scienter, a, an intent requirement to that prong. 
Now, you don't have to necessarily go that far. Not all courts have adopted it, but again, there's not a clear standard on this, which means that piercing is more appropriate if a company is deliberately or recklessly creating a company that cannot pay its bills. If you're simply negligent and you don't maintain enough capital because you're dumb or lazy, that's not enough to rise to liability if we have a scienter requirement. Not all courts will take that approach. So is this different than the test used in Walkowski? Not really. The result would be the same, but this one is a little bit more structured. And as law students, you may prefer a more structured test. Now you have one, right? You have three prongs that you can evaluate, one leading to the next. And so I would suggest that if you're going to address piercing in torts cases, you can adopt the alter ego test because it's a little easier than just throwing all the factors into a big soup as Walkowski did, but either test would result in the same result. All right, so uh, last, last few things. Yes, sure. Quick question. Yeah, How course. would vicarious liability factor into the whole control factor, the second prong? Vicarious liability of the? So, of, the of an employer agent, or what does money matter? So the vicarious liability would pertain to an employee and an agent within an organization, yeah. but not, it, would, it does not, tra you, you would need a separate veil piercing to go up, up the chain. If, however, telecom did more than own constructs, but actually directed it, if telecom hired a constructs driver to, you know, to, to, to whatever, and, and maybe said, we need to get that, I don't care if the speed limit's 60 and it's snowing, you're doing 80 because this shipment of telecom equipment needs to be delivered. There we could see an argument for uh, liability, but here this was a totally separate operating entity, and so vicarious liability wouldn't apply since there wasn't that agency relationship. So, that's, so I mean, like, between the parent and the subsidiary, that control needs to be there, period. And In order for there to be vicarious liability, you have to actually be directing a person to yeah. do a task, as opposed to simply owning a company, right. right? And so, I mean, likewise, like, you're a share, let's say you go back to Microsoft, you may be a shareholder of Microsoft, right? That's different, that relationship changes, however, if you start engaging with some member of Microsoft to do a certain thing. And so, so long as you maintain that appropriate role of the shareholder, sort of just, just voting for the board and electing them, the board then will make decisions for the company. And even their liability will be limited. The CEO who sent the driver out, maybe some liability for him there, and that's why we have insurance and things like that. So what is the argument then for enterprise liability? Why would we create a situation where you're liable for your parent companies? Well, it expands assets to corporate creditors without imposing liability on the shareholders. So some will favor enterprise liability, as a, even if they don't favor individual liability, because it allows more collection, but it still doesn't go to individuals. We'll talk about that a little more when we get to corporate groups. Um, but it doesn't actually matter in Walkowski. Why? Because the other corporations in this economic unit were likewise undercapitalized, if you will, or minimally capitalized. So what kind of advice do you give your clients after learning this? Now, I'm not talking about contracts yet, different set of advice for your clients with regard to contracts, but if your clients are a corporation, are corporations, and they do things that can result in tort liability, what should they do to protect the shareholders? Well, let's take a look at the factors and flip them, right? What would we do? How would you advise, for example, the owner of a taxi fleet to organize the business? Well, one thing we learned in this multiple corporation structure was respected. You probably should have a different company for every cab and maintain the minimum amount of insurance because apparently maintaining minimum insurance is enough. You're not undercapitalized, you're minimally capitalized, but that's enough. You don't have to worry if you're minimally capitalized, it's not undercapitalized. So we'd advise the client set up a multiple structure. In fact, when I work with clients who are dealing real estate transactions, I always encourage them to look at a series limited liability company, which allows you to do this without multiple filings. Talk more about that at a different class. But in any event, this multiple structure generally works, but you only, it only works if the corporations act like separate entities. And that means that you need to observe corporate formalities, and you know how to do that now because of what we studied in authority and how corporations grant authority. So that's a fundamental lesson that fits into here. Uh, if they're not observing formalities, much greater risk of having them commingled. Uh, and again, commingling, you don't want to be dipping in the till. Make sure there's that separate bank account, and not just a separate bank account between the owner, 
and the companies, but that means if you want these companies to be treated separately, they each need their own bank account. Right? Any commingling can result in those two being seen as the same entity. So if you have companies A, B, C, D, E, and F, and there's only one bank account, you're now running a risk of having enterprise liability. And so you tell your clients no, you need a separate bank account for all those, all those cabs. That's more important even than having separate assets. They shared a garage, for example. There was some common plan to all this. That increases the risk a little bit, but bank accounts are the biggest thing. Um, and you know, you might tell the, the you know the, the the founders come to you and say, uh, we kind of ran over this guy. I think a lawsuit might be coming. Um, can I like issue a dividend? So no, no, that's a bad move, right? So if there is a big liability coming, you know, a big contract coming due, you ran over a pedestrian, et cetera, et cetera, and the client says, you know, I'd really like to avoid liability for this. The company has a million bucks. I really did this guy solid, so like I'm probably I'm probably going to be hit up for that. Can I can I take that money and issue a dividend? No. Uh, we go back to some of the concepts about fraudulent conveyance there, but also if you're shuffling access, uh, the New York court would uh, more likely pierce in that case. So to wrap it up, then when we learn about piercing, we talk about these first two cases. How are they similar? Well. In both cases, we're talking about involuntary claimants. Tort claimants are, by and large, involuntary. And we're talking about operating companies that had minimum insurance. They were not underinsured. They were not well insured, but they had the minimum insurance required by law. In both cases, we had a wholly owned subsidiary dominated by a parent, right? similar structures. And we find a conclusion that piercing is not appropriate. And I'll add to that, in both cases, we have a finding we have no evidence of commingling assets. We have no evidence of uh, not observing corporate formalities. And so we have the absence of those plus factors. There were some differences. Radis Wiki is apparent to a corporation. And so even if there was piercing, shareholders themselves would not be liable. But that didn't seem to make a difference. We're still going to protect interest even for corporations. Radis Wiki was really trying to get at an enterprise liability concept. But the court applied the same doctrine. Should we then, is this right? Should we protect corporate owners in the same way as individual owners? Well, the court seemed to. But you can think about whether or not you think that's fair. Uh, because you can insert many levels of corporate interests, one on top of the other, like a set of you know, those Russian dolls. There's only a little one inside. Whereas there's a limit to how many natural persons can be sitting on top of this. And do we achieve the purposes that limited liability is meant to achieve by protecting corporations the same level as people? These are open questions. So then, why should the internal operations of the corporations be relevant for torts? I mean, it's not like the company authorized uh, uh, running over some guy, right? They didn't have a board meeting and say, OK, let's go run over Carlton. Let's go run over Walkowski today. That, that wasn't an authorized decision. So why do we care? about uh, books and records. Well, some have argued that if corporate formalities are flouted, it signifies that the company is not being run as a business, but as an alter ego. And it helps the court give a reason to hold a person liable. It's kind of a quid pro quo. I mean, having a corporation is a bargain. You get certain liability privileges, certain immunities, and you have certain responsibilities for it. So while the argument uh, does not hold as much weight as we'll see as it does in contracts, courts will still look at whether there has been uh, a flouting of corporate uh, formalities. All right, so next we'll come back. We'll talk about piercing and contracts cases. And we have a kind of complex case. I'll try to diagram uh, the case of Freeman v. Complex Computing Co. And what's interesting is I, we're going to try to highlight the point that actually there is piercing in contracts more than in torts. I invite you to think about why that might be true, maybe going back to some of the reasons we have piercing in the first place. And we talk about uh, DeBarge versus Darbro, if I can pronounce it. And then we're going to have time, we should certainly have time, to talk about our two piercing in corporate cases, which was Weston Hotels and OTR Associates, the IBC. Note that IBC Services, International Blimpy Corporation. So go and enjoy a sub sandwich, enjoy your Easter holiday, and I'll see you next Wednesday.